Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. We've got a power packed session for you. We call this the power hour uh, for the profession. And I, got, I have to credit the programming team for today's town hall. We really have an incredible lineup. And what it's all about is bringing you timely information, doing our best job at interpreting it, and then talking about strategies and capabilities. And we're gonna be doing all of that today. We're gonna kick things off uh, with an update uh, from our DC team. And then we're gonna have a fireside chat with Lisa Bodell, who's one of the leading you know, futurists and uh, keynoters in the country and the world. And she's going to talk about simplicity and gaining a competitive advantage of, you know, simplifying things. And I think she's going to give us a lot of good insights. Then we've got Carrie Hisback, who's going to talk to us about the latest with PPP and ERC. And then we're going to be bringing uh, the chief auditor of the AICPA uh, with Carl Peterson to be talking to talk about a new quality management standard. And then we'll close with our open form and closing remarks. So here's a lineup of presenters. I will introduce them as they uh, join the show. And I'd like to now welcome Mark Peterson, who you all know uh, leads the AICPA advocacy team. And Mark, it's been, I look back at the last couple of months, uh, Lauren Fingstag, you know, kicked things off in August with a civics lesson on the process. And then we've been updating everybody over the past two months on you know the infrastructure bill and the, the reconciliation package and barry last week uh, said there was going to be a vote on thursday night and we all know that vote did not happen so why don't you uh kind of bring us up to speed on, on where things stand and i don't think did it you know nothing surprises you in dc right no it doesn't surprise i mean i think we've we've um called this process since the beginning very fragile and it has stayed fragile throughout. You know, at the time Barry made those comments on Thursday, it was the best available information. The speaker had called a vote. Now, when you're the speaker of the house, the way you know you have enough votes is oftentimes to call the vote so that people have to put their cards on the table and the negotiating stopped. So the negotiating stopped and the cards on the table made it look like that the infrastructure bill was not gonna pass. Now that is not because of a lack of support for the infrastructure bill. There is bipartisan support for that bill, both sides of the aisle, but it is being used as leverage um, by the House progressives to make sure that they get a, a top line number that they can agree with from the Senate moderate Democrats. So this is really one party negotiating over this. Um, and Senators Manchin from West Virginia and Sinema from Arizona had not committed to a top line number. And that's why Thursday kind of crumbled. Now, I will say since then, mm -hmm. there has been a ton of negotiating going on um, and the White House has been very engaged. And I will say that numbers have been going back and forth, which is a good sign for an outcome. So Senator Manchin suggested, you know, 1.5. And then, you know, it, we, we started to hear 2.9 and then 2. 1.9. And so our prediction is probably around in the 2-4 range, um, just because that's kind of how negotiations go. Um, but we still think it's going to happen. This is all playing out in a, in a very kind of, you know, dramatic way. Uh, but the votes are there for the infrastructure bill once it's put on the floor. And reconciliation, the, the, um, the Biden proposals will, will eventually get there, although uh, I think that the proposal that we saw come out of um, Ways and Means in the House with, at the 3.5, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shrink and the provisions in it are going to change and the pay-fors, which is very important, will definitely change as it goes through the Senate process. So, Mark, we, we, last week we spent about 20 minutes, you know, talking about some of those tax proposals that were in the House bill and some of the items that were not. I mean, and we started unpacking them. There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of complexity uh, to what will happen if, if when these bills pass. And now it looks like it's going to be between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we're all of a sudden, we're just going to have a, a more compressed time to, to get our, to get our arms around what will eventually be in these bills. Absolutely. 
one of the one of the um it's not a complicating thing it's just a reality of the process the house went through the committee process and they went first right so right. they house usually goes first does go first on revenue issues now what's going to happen is the senate will do their consideration they're in the middle of that now but really they're they're not planning on taking it through the committee process so it, there's going to be um very little information that comes out it will be no, negotiated amongst a small group mm -hmm. um and then what's most likely to happen later in the year and we'll get into why that is later in the year in the next slide is that it will be it will be released to the house back as kind of a take it or leave it that's that's the way things are shaping up again it's going to get smaller and i think that the provisions in it and the pay fors things like complexity potentially around partnerships and things like mm -hmm. that are, are going to be a challenge we're going to be watching closely well let's this is looks like you know kicking the can down the road here but it looks <laughs> like today maybe you can make a prediction that will come true uh, they're going to uh you know ex pass the debt ceiling uh, uh bill here well uh, the the team's supposed to be texting me if something happens they've negotiated a deal on the debt limit the treasury had said the debt limit was probably going to run out uh october 18th that's the x date it's not a science they make estimates about when it's going to run out and if it we, we've never defaulted on the debt and so that creates a lot of anxiety ripples in the market you know concerns about interest rates um and, and other huge challenges. It's not the kind of thing anybody wants to mess with. However, it takes a burning platform to get decisions made in DC. And so right now today, it looks like there's a deal that will, uh, Republicans will give the Democrats in the Senate enough votes to extend it by four, $480 billion. So raise it, not suspend it, but raise it by $480 billion. So that most likely gets you to about December 3rd. Now. You know, last week, the other thing they did was extend the uh, funding for the federal government. They kicked that can called the continuing resolution, but funding for the government also to the be beginning of December. So the way this is shaping up, if it, if it plays out today like we think it's going to, is both the debt limit and the um, budget, the funding for the, for the federal government is both going to run out again on December 3rd. So think of just a new cliff that's being shaped up in December. So what does that mean for reconciliation? I think what it means is that it's going to get pushed. So now once they resolve the debt limit issue, they will have more time. The more time they get, the more time they use. So that gets you to, you know, the beginning of December. They'll figure out how to deal with the with government funding and the debt limit. But, you know, you, I could also see this getting backed up into, you know, right before the Christmas holidays um, to create a burning flat platform in order to get the, the, the deal done and together. Well, Mark, we're going to go back with an open forum. We're probably already at like 60, 70, approaching 100 questions here. And one is just, I mean, this is an obvious question related to our ERC and PPP area. But they're saying, OK, now, so are they going to make ERC retroactive now if the infrastructure bill? doesn't get passed till the end of December. Uh, so, I mean, these these are the types of questions that, that are gonna be raised. A hundred percent, I'm, listen, it's gonna be rough. Uh, we're, we're, still, we're still dealing with, you know, a lot of the, of the stimulus packages and looking for guidance, uh, how this new tax bill is gonna impact that. And, you know, passing the bill is only half of the marathon. You gotta run back to the beginning in order to get guidance and get implementation through the agency. So. You know, I hate to say it to practitioners, but, you know, it's going to be a rough season. Right. Well, Mark, uh, thanks for this opening. We're going to we're going to have a good open forum session. We'll try to we'll try to take take more questions related to all of these activities uh, in D.C. Uh, but so we'll 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 see. We'll see you in, in a little bit. Great. Thank you. So now I'd like to have Lisa Bodell uh, join. Uh, Lisa, it's great to have you with uh, with us. I was with Lisa um, at Digital CPA in uh, December of 2019. Yeah. Which, yeah, where you gave a fantastic keynote. Thank you. And some really great concepts. And I, 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 so much of our audience took a lot of those concept down. Those concepts down. I know they've been leveraging them through the pandemic. So I really look forward to this discussion. <laughs> But just here's a little bit about uh, Lisa. She leads. She's a CEO of FutureThink. Uh, she's one of the top, you know, 50 keynoters in the world. Uh, she's written Why Simple Wins, and that's really what we're going to talk about: is some of 
some of her thinking around how uh, with, with being very intentional, uh, you can really be, be more productive. So it's how to be better use your time. And I love the title of this slide here to, in some ways to, to kick things off. And we can, we can probably drop, drop the slides here. But turning the, the great, uh, you know, reset into a great advantage. Yeah. And as you see, um, you know, what's going on with the great resonation and all the all the anxiety in, in the marketplace, what, what what's on your clients' minds and and how are you how are you analyzing what is happening uh, to these businesses and these workers? Well, it won't be shocking, Eric, in terms of um, what people are saying, but really what's happening is, um, you know, there's too many competing priorities and people are having a hard time focusing. So, you know, it's not just the volume of stuff, but it's the competing priorities in terms of constantly needing to pivot and be agile. Mm -hmm. And while that's really important, they just don't have enough time in the day. I mean, there's there's really great statistics showing that people now are working an average of one to two hours a day longer. Mm -hmm. right? Commute time is now work time. And uh, there's communication overload. So on average, especially for the audience here, the uh, IMs, emails, communications have gone up 50 to 65 percent. I mean, I, I feel it. I'm sure you feel right. it. too. So basically what we're looking at here is people are time starved. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they've never been busier. So they're they're looking at this. As how do I how do I operate in this new normal? And only only a handful of companies have really figured it out. Well, Lisa, one thing I want to ask the audience to do, you know, we've got seven to 8,000 people on right now, is just kind of slow down for the next 10 minutes and, and really listen to kind of some, some, some of these concepts, because I think this is important. I can tell you this audience here, uh, they have more opportunity than they've ever had, um, but more demands and more pressures on them than, than they've ever had. And even just what you heard with Mark and I, there's all, there's all things are constantly changing. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot that they need to do, and they've played a critical role for their business clients for the past year. So just mm -hmm. a little bit more about, you know, unpacking the the, the the Zoom fatigue and the burnout, and and you know our, this you know hybrid infra hybrid workforce that we're in right now. Well, you know, this kind of ties back to what we made a title for this speech, which is, you know, there's a great reset. And everyone seems to be talking about, you know, like the great exodus. I'm thinking that it's a great advantage because here's the what I'll call the blessing of COVID. I mean, health issues aside, yeah. what this forced us to do is it finally challenged our assumptions around not just how we work, but the work we're doing. And I think the big aha for so many people was they realized how much of their time they were wasting on completely unnecessary things. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I don't just mean the, hey, it looks like we can work remotely. I'm talking about, God, there were a lot of meetings and emails and processes that really just didn't need to be. So, you know, there were a lot of us that were, we thought we were in a groove but we were really in the rut. And the problem is it looks and feels the same. So I think the great thing here is we've recognized how much unnecessary work there is and people are trying to redefine what is meaningful work and how can we spend and pivot to that? Well, I mean, one thing I, I love about your work is, I mean, you give these recommendations. I, I want, so I'm gonna jump just to tease some of these recommendations out from you about yeah. you know meetings and email. So <laughs> when, you, when you think about, um, yeah, what, what, you, what you said at Digital CPA was you told everybody to start the year, just cancel all of your meetings and then <laughs> wait to see, and then you might have said it slightly differently and see what gets rescheduled to take back control of your time. Yeah, good one. I mean, it's interesting because this really what it comes down to, Eric, is how we're realizing we need to be more intentional with our time, right? We we say yes too easily and we don't know how to say no, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But, you know, just like budgets or statements of values, so are calendars. And since time is a non-renewable resource and we will never get it back, we have to really think about, you know, we really aren't, we're not capital constrained anymore. Mm -hmm. We are change and time constrained. So we've got to be more mindful of it. So I will tell you, when I ask people what they spend their day doing, it's meetings and emails and reports, really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some quick tips while we're here, I would say with, with emails, um, a great one that Fidelity uses is they, they practice bluff, right? Bottom line up front. And they've been able to cut down a significant amount of emails because it's forced people to really say, what are they asking people to do when they get an email? And it's made people question whether they need to send an email at all. Um, I know a lot of people that have declared meeting bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And I love that because it's they take all the calendars, all the meetings off the calendar, and you have to fight to get them 
put back on. Or um, another one that I love that Novartis does is you go on a time diet and that's 30 is the new 60. So how can you cut all your meetings in half, not in terms right. of the number, but the time? And a lot of people love that. So, I mean, and there, there's lots of lots of great tips there. And I think it is. It's just it seems it seems simple and obvious, um, but you need to you start doing it and actually it can produce great gains. So it's not so it's not all about production and efficiency. I mean, what you're talking here is no. not just, oh, I got to be more productive and more efficient. No. In fact, I, I'm glad you said that because, you know, if people go to their teams and say, hey, we're going to simplify because you need to be more productive. Um, that would be insulting to most people. Right. I, I think I'm productive, but I might not be simplified. So one of the things that we, we talk about people doing is this is about intention and meaningful work, not just productive and more. And, you know, if you could spend time thinking about, you know, what do you say yes to? What are the things you want to say yes to? And what did you say no to today? That's a really good mindset to have because then you're going to think with intention before you put it on your calendar and you're going to be mindful of at least trying to say no to something every single day. And if you don't say no to something, you're probably not focused. And just on the nose, we, we always put a lot of materials in our resource section. I mean, for everyone listening yeah. today, you, you can download the slides and, and we also have uh, the, the hints on how, how to say no, Lisa, that, that you've put out. Yeah, and Eric, I appreciate it because the you know the biggest thing that people ask me is, well, how do you say no? Because they want to be nice, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very cultural thing. So you're right. One of the things that they can get from you is uh, our tip sheet on 40 ways to say no, and then you can pick what works for you. When you look at just, and I know this is something you've been thinking about. When you think about, I saw some surveys of I don't know if it was IBM or some big company survey recently. Yeah. Uh, related to hybrid work and 70 percent of the people said they want hybrid work and then 70 percent of the people said they want they want more engagement how, <laughs> how are you so that i mean they're, and they're both right right so you, i want i want to i want to have flexible work and but i also want more engagement i want more in-person collaboration so where where, where is this where, where do you see all this going well, a couple things right? to bust a couple myths. First of all, hybrid work isn't new. I mean, when you think about large global organizations like people we work with, whether it's Siemens or it's Novartis or Pfizer, they've been working remotely and hybrid for years. But the reason they're successful with it is because, first of all, they um, set norms of communication. Because remember, a lot of complexity is driven by fear. It's fear. And if you can take that fear away by establishing norms, you know, video or no video, 30 minutes or 25 minute meetings, that goes a long way. And the other thing that I think is really helpful for people is um, you, you don't have to think of this as a either we're going to be in person or we're going to get engaged. The only way to be engaging is in person. That's not true. I think we just have to be more intentional with how we run our meetings because the average person every five minutes starts to multitask. I mean, that, that's a statistic. So why don't more of us spend time thinking about the question we want to ask in the meeting, the engagement that we want to have using different technologies like Mentimeter or Google Jamboards to shake people into new thinking and allow introverts and extroverts to be able to participate. Uh, and there's a million tips for things like that. But I think it's, you know, being more thoughtful about those things. Mm -hmm. So the meetings are engaging and productive rather than just showing up. And even what do you even think 15 minute meetings, 15, you know, quick, quick uh, stand up touch bases. I mean, that's what you miss. I mean, you miss that hallway conversation. So how do you replace <laughs> the hallway conversation? How in our is there more just people you know, leveraging the cell phone? Well, you know, yeah, I always say after a few, if emails go back and forth after three times, pick up the phone. I mean, that's what, what happens, but that's also a generational thing, I have to say. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, what's interesting about the, the hallway thing is, you know, we've lost a lot of that social lubricant, as you said, that mm -hmm. commonality, the informality, because we're not together. And the unfortunate thing about that is, you know, they say most ideas um, don't get killed in the boardroom, they get killed in the hallways. Mm -hmm. And that's because that's where the real talk happens. So if we're going to be working hybrid, we've got to create those norms and some informal time so people can really say what they think versus just being in a structured Zoom call. And that that's why we see it like Fidelity and State Street and a lot of other pe places, people having 15-minute um, check-ins with their teams just to get the offhand stuff and uh, office hours where people can just drop in unstructured and talk about what's on their mind. It's very, it, it's the kind of opposite effect, right? Being less structured to get more production done. And it, what, I, what I'm seeing, at least as I, you know, with a lot of companies, a lot of firms is 
there's going to be a bigger difference between high performing teams I mean, pr prior to the pandemic high performing teams mattered a lot but now actually the competitive advantage of a true high performing team is that much more because it's harder it's harder to do all of this so when you're doing it well mm -hmm. you're going to have that competitive advantage well the high performing teams to your point are the ones that can do the two c's they can communicate and they can collaborate and the the problem that people mix up is they think that meetings are collaboration and they're not right collaboration is when you have a set goal and it's mm -hmm. different than cooperation and it's different than being present so you know the the difference with uh, collaboration is you've got a set goal and usually there's a leader. And so we've just got to take charge more of our meetings and realize that it's not just about showing up. And that's how the hybrid teams will win. It's not just about Zoom meetings as a purpose. And, and Lisa, what I like about a lot of your materials is just kind of the, the techniques and in, in what these techniques can do to kind of your functioning. We've been talking a lot about mental health. Absolutely mm -hmm. important. But this, when you, when, when you when you can get your arms around some of this this in itself can help with that mental health stress so how, how are you i mean i'm sure you've been brought into a lot of mental health discussions how do you correlate your work in mental health that is such a great question because they're directly related right i think that by simplifying you get time back for things that matter and you know unless you were hired for your email and meeting skills which i think most of us weren't so i think that the idea around simplicity ties directly to mental health because you uh, have less fatigue you're not spending time on things that you find draining or obligatory mm -hmm. and you're working on the things that you think you were born to do and I think that alone, uh, that really energizes people. You know, people don't get up in the morning for shareholder value. They get up for meaningful work. And your collaboration point is, is, is so important because guess what? If you're, if you're struggling with collaboration and you're sending those very long emails because you think that's the way to solve it, then you send one more long email, um, then it just, it, it, you start going into this kind of, you know, dark abyss. So let's, I mean, let's just jump here as we, what we try to do here in the town hall is we, we, we try to change how we deliver information as well, delivering Great. it in these 10 to 15 minute uh, bite-sized segments. So let's kind of just close out and talk about some additional recommendations. Uh, I know you've got processes here, uh, work, a, work a hackathon, eliminate time sucks. So just why don't we well, let me talk about though. That's great. That's great. You know, it's, it's interesting. It, there's so many ideas that people have to get time back, but we just don't think to ask. You know, right. that's the thing about simplification. It's free, <laughs> and it's about getting time and money back. So why wouldn't we do it? Um, you know, I talk a lot about killing stupid rules with your team. People yeah. love to kill stupid things. Um, when you ask people to eliminate things, they get very personal. So how you phrase it is important. So talking about time sucks, you know, what are your biggest time sucks? Uh -huh. And the other thing I really do like that a lot of pharmas are doing right now are work hackathons. You know, if you are very process heavy, believe me, someone has found a workaround or a hack. And uh -huh. we'd, we'd really benefit each other by having, you know, rather than these tech hacks, work hacks. And I've seen a lot of people streamline their processes by hacking with each other. And I'll tell you, like at MasterCard and HBO, groups that work, you know, across right. silos you know one group is always blaming the other they do a hackathon together and so you can see the issues that each has with the same process and uh they eliminate the problems faster well i mean lisa i i i want to engage more with you i mean one thing that we do is we bring in you know you know thinkers like yourself to the firms to the profession right. just to really study how, how we're working like like you've been doing that with these other companies so I, I, I want to thank you for today, and I look forward to um, having you at, at more events. And I, and I do. I mean, we bring this to you, to the town hall attendees, because we think this matters. This matters along with the tax updates, the legislative updates. These types of strategies can really help you win. So any, any final, final closing remarks for us? I think if people actually, they want to innovate, the front end of innovation is simplification, because you've got to create the space for that thinking and valuable work to happen. So really great to be here, Eric. And I hope that there are some tips that people will use to get time back. I appreciate well, it. Well, thanks. Uh, and we can bring the bring the slides back up. And now we're going to move into the, the next next section here uh, with uh, Carrie Hipsack, who you all know well. Uh, she hasn't been with us for, for a couple months or maybe a month or so. Uh, but Carrie is always with us because she's a driver of answering your questions and all of the fantastic 
uh, PCPS uh, materials, one of the one of the true leaders here at the ICPA. So welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Eric. That was a great introduction. And I'm always appreciative of an opportunity to be back on these fantastic town halls, although it might be tough to follow Lisa and all the great content she covered. So as Eric mentioned, I'm typically hiding out in the background trying to address questions, but today I'm going to walk through some updates and reminders for these programs. Let's start with a summary of PPP forgiveness stats. Of the $794 billion distributed for PPP loans, 71% of the total amount distributed has been forgiven. In total, that leaves about $232 billion of the PPP loans that have not officially been forgiven or had a forgiveness application submitted. Although the majority have been forgiven, if you or your clients is not one of them, I'd like to direct you to the bottom left of the slide as a reminder, if payments had to be made because the initial 10-month deferral period has passed, but the loan is later forgiven by the SBA, the borrower can still receive all the PPP funds, including the interest. So make note of that interest portion. As we move on to the SVG, SVOG, sorry, we see the majority, there it is, we see the majority of the initial grants have been dispersed. The biggest change from last week is that the supplemental grants that the SBA began issuing at the end of September have started to make their way to the hands of the recipients. Since last week's town hall, $26 million have been dispersed of the total $1.2 billion awarded. Next, I'd like to take a look at accounting for economic recovery programs. The AICPA released two technical questions and answers documents known as TQAs, related to PPP as well as SVOG and RRF. I paired up with some of my colleagues to create videos walking through the accounting options presented in both the TQAs. We've highlighted accounting for PPP in the past and brand new as of yesterday, we released an accounting for SVOG and RRF. All the videos are hyperlinked in this resource here or you can easily find them on our main PPP page at AICPA.org forward slash SBA. Hey, Carrie, I just want to let you know, we get a lot of, you know, a lot of questions coming in and comments, but one thing that, that, that I'm hearing is a, there's a, the forgiveness process is working well. I mean, that's just one, I think we, we've been saying that over the last couple of weeks that, you know, the turnaround time, people have said here, they, they submitted some applications on Monday and it's Thursday and they've already been, it's already been forgiven. So the lenders, the SBA, everyone's standing up the processes. And I, but you know, I'll say this: some 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 firms are are really staging the work, in particular for the 2021 applications. Clearly, the 2020 applications need need to, need to get done. So here's but here's here's one of the the, the hot topics related to uh, understanding uh, the PPP ERC interplay. Yeah, Lisa addressed this yes, or yesterday, oh my goodness, last week, and she went through a thorough, ex thorough example about PPP and ERC interplay. One of the questions we've been receiving since last week's example is how do I change my PPP forgiveness application to take advantage of ERC? Now, this has been asked because a borrower may have included more eligible payroll expenses than were necessary on their PPP loan forgiveness application. And the short answer to this is you don't modify a PPP forgiveness application since there is no guidance for modifying them. However, IRS Notice 2021-20 highlights that any payroll costs paid during the covered period will still be considered qualified wages for the ERC if they're not part of that forgiven component. Let's assume a borrower has a $100,000 PPP loan. The borrower submits a PPP loan forgiveness application with $40,000 of eligible non-payroll expenses. And because it was easier and aligned with their payroll reports, they included 80,000 of eligible payroll expenses, but they only needed 60,000 to get the full loan forgiven. The remaining $20,000 of payroll expense that was included on the forgiveness application can still be used for ERC. This is, of course, assuming that all the other ERC requirements are met. So the follow-up questions we've been receiving to that is how do I allocate PPP and ERC wages used, and do I have to use all PPP wages in a linear fashion as the wages are allocated between the two programs? 
I think Lisa has said this before, but just want to reiterate, there is no guidance for how wages must be allocated between the two programs. At a minimum for PPP, the wages must be paid or incurred during the covered period and any additional limitations would need to be considered. For example, no employee can be allocated more than $46,154 of payroll under PPP and no owner employee can be allocated more than $20,833 of payroll costs um, across all, all business entities that received PPP. So that's just some quick reminders for you all. We're gonna move on to idle real quick. Most of this content is a reminder from last week. I wanted to bring the slide back because tomorrow the SBA will begin approving loans over $500,000 up to the reinstated cap of $2 million. This opportunity is still available through the end of the year and some of the recent changes may make idle an option for small businesses when they haven't considered it in the past. And those changes are summarized here. And there's also a link to the IFR for more details. Last but not least, here's a summary of the target, targeted idle advance programs. You may recall the primary idle advance program ran, ran out of funding a while ago, but there are still opportunities for an advance, which does not have to be repaid if the applicants can meet the criteria summarized here. Similar to the original idle advance, the targeted idle advance provides up to $10,000 and there is a supplemental targeted advance that can provide up to an additional $5,000. More details are available on the SBA site. There's a link here and it also contains a variety of resources, including a mapping tool to determine if a potential applicant is in a low income community. So check those out if they could be of use to you or your clients. Well, I mean, Carrie, I mean, just, just an, a tremendous uh, review of, of critical information. Some of the questions coming in, one is just like all these acronyms and and sometimes we, we start uh, a little deep into some of these updates. We've got the PCPS Resource Center that you can leverage. These materials, once again, you can download them. All of these links are clickable. Uh, anything that you want to add to just someone who's trying to get their arms around a, a few of the topics that, that 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 you discuss, which at times what we're doing is just kind of giving the latest information related to them. Exactly. I would definitely recommend going and downloading the resources and clicking on the links. At the end, Eric will go through some of the additional resources we have that also have hyperlinks. I think in the CPA profession, we're all used to using acronyms. Um, but definitely difficult to keep up with all of them sometimes, especially some of these acronyms that most of us didn't even know just a few short years ago. Yeah, well said. Well, Carrie, thanks. And uh, we will uh, bring you back uh, for open forum and lots of questions coming in that I'm looking at. So we're going to have a great discussion there. Now I'd like to introduce Carl Peterson, who you all know, uh, leads the small firm area for the AICPA. And Jennifer Burns, many of you may know, but she's she's the chief auditor for the AICPA. So I'm really looking forward uh, to this session uh, with the two of you. So Carl, I'll let you uh, take it away and maybe give uh, Jennifer a, a broader introduction. Yeah, no, thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. You know, you talk about the uh, power hour. Uh, we're going to talk about probably one of the hottest topics in practice today, uh, especially over the last couple months. And uh, so, you know, I'm excited to be able to talk about this, Jennifer, we're, you know, our chief auditor, and and, and we'll kind of share some thoughts and, and things that are happening with this. But Jennifer, as you know, in my role as VP of uh, small firm interest, as soon as the ASB exposure draft came out, you know, with the proposed quality management standard, I started to hear from small firms right away. Uh, they had a lot of concerns about the impact that this is going to have on their practice, a number of issues. There's a lot of anxiety out there, I think, with small firms all across the country. And in fact, you know, it, as you know, I, I meet with firms every week and just even this, over this past week, this was a hot topic. So in your role as chief auditor AICPA, maybe you want to expand that on as well, but I know you've heard a lot from firms and members as well. Can you tell us why, everybody wants to know why, why now, why is ASB looking to change standards around quality management? Yes, absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Carl. I'm happy to be here today to talk about the quality management exposure draft. And thanks for bringing this important topic to the town hall today. As you know, quality is foundational to what we do. 
And everyone who relies on the work we perform relies on the fact that it will be high quality. And one of the tools that we have uh, to help support quality are our quality control standards. Well, so the last time the quality control standards were updated uh, was back in October of 2006, which back then the iPhone didn't even exist. So a lot has changed since 2006 and the concepts that were incorporated into the exposure draft have become fundamental. So for example, the concept of performing a risk assessment, the concept of continuous improvement, those have all become expected. So we think it is important to embed those concepts as well as some others in the standards to help support our commitment to quality. The proposed standards have been influenced by results of peer reviews, studies by other regulators, as well as uh, the IAASB's project on quality management. The standards that the ASB proposed were written to converge with the IAASB's uh, quality management standards. And it's important uh, and, and, and it makes sense to converge because concepts related to quality should not be dramatically different across standard setters or across jurisdictions. And the thought of lack of convergence among various standard setters and jurisdictions would make it really difficult and challenging for firms. They might have to have multiple systems of quality control in place, which just isn't practical. So the new standards uh, were also written to provide an integrated approach to quality management. And the important aspect of, of having this integrated approach is the concept of tailoring uh, your quality management program specific to your firm and the risks that are identified uh, in relation to your practice. So the important thing here is that we're trying to write the standards in a way that they're scalable and can be tailored to your firm. Uh, scalability. We're going to have to have a follow-up conversation about that one of these days, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, but, but we're going to get into here in a minute, I think, you know, the, the, the real issues that impact small firms. And but I, I know when this when this exposure draft came out, uh, you know, we had conversations, people on your team, we had conversations and we kind of all knew this was going to be a material change in how firms design their system of quality control. And I know your team reached out to small firms and users for input. What type of outreach did your team do and, and what was the response? Well, so let me say that, first of all, outreach is critical to the standard setting process. Uh, for example, the feedback we obtain through the exposure period, uh, it really helps the ASB understand potential challenges in applying what has been proposed. It also helps to identify any unintended consequences. Um, and it's important, uh, you know, as, as part of being a part of this profession, it's important to be engaged and provide that feedback through the exposure period. So I, I really do appreciate all of the comments received. And, and since the exposure draft went out, we've been very focused on raising awareness and doing that outreach so we could get that feedback. And over the course of the summer, we held 15 roundtables. We had about 500 participants at those roundtables. And it really was an excellent way to engage in dialogue with a lot of our members and hear that feedback directly. So that was extremely helpful. Um, we also wanted to make it easy for people to provide feedback on this exposure draft. So for example, we developed a template that people could use if they wanted to write a formal letter. We also said, please provide informal feedback and email would do just fine. So in a lot of cases, we got just that, some emails, which was again, terrific to get the feedback. And also importantly, we've been in dialogue with the PCPS Technical Issues Committee, or what we like to call TIC, another acronym for everybody out there. Um, we do have TIC representation on uh, the ASB Quality Management Task Force. Uh, TIC is the committee that uh, represents the views of smaller firms. TIC also did provide a comment letter, a formal comment letter to the ASB on the proposal. Um, and in total, we got over 170 comment letters uh, which is the highest number we've received in at least 15 years. Um, and of those 171, I think about 106 were from firms uh, with 20 professionals or less. So a lot of feedback and I, I really appreciate everybody out there for sending us uh, in your views. 
Yeah, I, I think you know, it's, I think it's pretty phenomenal that the majority of the comment letters you got back were from small firms, and um, and and the other thing I want to point out, Tick does an absolutely phenomenal job in truly representing small firm interest when they look at these any standard that's been proposed or any issues that's out there, and the way they look at it and make their you know comment about it, it, it does keep the small firm practitioner. Uh, in their minds, and and it, and we really appreciate the work that they do. So we might go ahead and go to the next slide, and 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 so from those comment letters, and I'll tell or the emails, and I'll tell you even from the calls that I've had, the conversations that I've had with firms on this exposure draft, on the quality management standards been proposed. What were the top issues that you heard from firms? Well, so there were three top issues that came through the comment letters and all the dialogue loud and clear. First, um, there are significant concerns regarding the potential prohibition of self-inspection in relation to monitoring of completed engagements. And here, practitioners are worried about the lack of resources available to perform third-party inspections if self-inspection is prohibited. They're also worried about the costs and whether the benefits outweigh the costs, particularly given other safeguards in place to support quality and monitor completed engagements, including peer review. Um, the second issue we heard a lot about was um, a lot of concern regarding the idea of a cooling off period for engagement quality reviewers and how that could actually be detrimental to audit quality. So for example, while a cooling off period might result in someone perceived to be more objective performing the engagement quality review, at that same time, that same person might be less competent if they don't have the same sort of industry uh, experience. Uh, so the ASB will be focusing in part on finding that right balance between competency and objectivity. The last topic we heard a lot about were uh, concerns about the effective date. There has been a lot of change in the last few years in both accounting and auditing, and we heard a lot of concerns about uh, if we add changes now to the quality management standards while the profession is still absorbing those other changes, that will uh, create more challenge for, for all firms. Um, so on each of these issues, the task force has been uh, discussing the comments that have come in and trying to develop some alternatives for the auditing standards board to consider. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> I was just thinking about some of the uh, calls and conversations I've had with small firms. There's a lot of passion out there and, and a lot of, a lot of passion, a lot of cultural language, a lot of passion. We'll just leave it there. But I, I know that, you know, you guys have done all this outreach to firms and users and, and, and truly have listened. I think this has been, a, a phenomenal um, process to have gone through and watching this exposure draft and working with the teams to get to where, you know, we are today. Um, but, but since it's, you know, the, the comment period is closed, can you give us an idea of what are the next steps? What's, what should members and small firms be thinking about and be aware of that are the next steps as we move this forward? Absolutely. And, and I appreciate all the passion out there. It's great to see that people are very engaged and very, um, uh, very focused on this important issue for the profession as a whole. So everybody on my team is also uh, very, very passionate about it. And um, now that the comment period has closed, the we entered this time where the ASB will be considering the comments received and considering potential changes to the exposure draft. And so actually the Auditing Standards Board is meeting next week um, and they will be talking about those three top issues that we just talked about, self-inspection, cooling off, and effective date. And I expect there to be significant discussion on those topics next week. And I also expect that there will be some preliminary decisions made on those issues. It's also, I think, important to keep in mind that the ASB is made up of 19 members. Um, so, you know, the big four are only four. So the other 15 seats are, you know, by vast majority, smaller firms and, um, you know, others who uh, participate on the ASB. Um, so we've actually posted materials that are going to be driving those discussions next week. If you're interested in uh, seeing what the ASB specifically will discuss, that's posted on the Auditing Standards Board webpage on the AICPA website. Um, the, AI, uh, the ASB will continue to discuss the quality management uh, cha potential changes to the exposure draft over the course of the next several meetings. And then the goal is to develop a final standard that supports quality uh, while taking into account the various costs and benefits that we have to try to weigh. 
Um, the ASB does plan to vote on a final standard sometime in Q2 of next year. Stay tuned about what the ASB might say next week about an effective date. Um, and the ASB meetings are now live streamed. So anybody out there who's interested in listening to the discussions, you can uh, listen in real time. And if you're not available next week and you're still interested in hearing uh, what the ASB discussed, it is available. It will be available for replay. We've started doing that with all of our meetings. Um, so you can uh, look for that too if you can't make it next week. Can, you know, not to put you on the spot here, actually, but it, doesn't the discussion paper also, does that is that the, the paper that also includes recommendations and, and maybe safeguards that you guys have uh, talked about and, and, and are asking ASB to consider? Is that it, part of that discussion it, paper? It does, actually. So yeah, I, um, I think it's important to get, I think if, if listeners want to go take a look at what the, you know, the brain trust has talked about and thought about to get to where we can get ASB to go, this is my opinion as a small firm advocate, in the right direction to where we need to be so there's no unintended consequences with the proposed statement of standards on quality management as proposed. So uh, that's an important discussion paper that's available and it's you have public access to it, right? So. Yes, exactly. And I can, um, you know, I can, I can preview some of those if, if we have a couple more minutes, I can mention. So for yeah. example, on the effective date, the task force has recommended that the effective date be pushed out. Uh, so that is, I think, probably likely, but we have to see what the ASB says. Uh, the, on the self-inspection issue, uh, the task force is also recommending um, a risk-based approach to self-inspection. So that self-inspection would not be prohibited. And on the cooling off period, uh, it's something similar. So, um, you know, no promises because the ASB have to, has to make these decisions and have the debate next week. Um, so take a look at that paper and tune in if you're interested. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll tell you just, you know, as I, after I read the paper, as a practitioner, because I, you know, I've been here nine years now at the AICPA, and when I was in practice, I feel that the, the recommendations that the uh, task force has put together for ASB to consider um, gives me a lot of comfort that's going the right direction. So I really appreciate that. So thanks for the time, Jennifer. This has been great. Well, and I, I got to call. It's a live show, so you know we always bring live questions. So I got me bring a couple of live questions to uh, to you and Jennifer. That was that was great, and it, and we also here, uh, Jennifer, will bring them updates on what what comes out of these future future ASB meetings, and we we will definitely make uh, those links available to them if they want to they want to watch watch directly. So a couple of the questions here. One just. You 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 did just uh, review it again, but just on self inspection, like three or four questions came in about it. Will it be part of the the final standard? You know, wanting it to be part of the final standard. So maybe just comment a little bit further on uh, on on the self self inspection and how you see that 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 going forward. What the task force is recommending that the ASB consider is that to not outright prohibit self inspection. So. Uh, what they're recommending is adding some language to the standard that would say something like if the firm does not have sufficient resources to uh, perform inspection of completed engagements other than self-inspection, that self-inspection would not necessarily be prohibited. So we'll see how the ASB feels about that language next week and if they agree to add it. Okay, and then Car I'll let Carl and Jennifer here. I mean, this you, you've been Carl. You won't be surprised by, by this this comment here. Uh, what is this going to? What do you think this is going to do to small firms? Is this going to drive some, some small firms out of providing, uh, you know, reviews and, and compilations? Which, and I'll I'll just say this. One thing I, I think about peer review and all these different standards this is the differentiator. We we know you know non CPA firms they don't have these these types of of quality measures. And that's what makes the profession great. So, hey, I, I, I shouldn't ask a question and give an answer, but yeah. I did. I want, I want, but I want you uh, to kind of respond to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, Eric, that if it, there may be some follow up, absolutely. If somebody's not really going to take the time and look at the new proposed standard once it's finalized, which I think will incorporate some changes and tweaks that have been recommended by the SB task force. And once you've done that, is I if they adopt the recommendations, I think the major concerns that small firms have uh, are going to be alleviated, and um, I, I, the value of small firms in this space is so great. Um, it, it would be a shame if people were to leave 
without really considering, wait a minute, oh, I can make this change. I need to spend some time up front to create a new system of quality control, quality management and work through this process. But then going forward, the value is still there. And I, and I don't think, um, we, you know, I know we don't want to see small firms get out of the space because the value to not only the profession, but also our small and medium sized enterprises, not for profits, rural communities everywhere, the value of that small CPA firm is, is greater than it's ever been. And That's right. The value, great, yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry. Yeah, the ahead. value that they provide from a public interest perspective is is too important. So uh, we are taking into account all this feedback, and hopefully, we can come to the right balance that allows uh, small firms to continue to perform this important work. Excellent. Well, we're gonna we're gonna move into uh, open forum now. So both Carl and Jennifer, uh, stay with me. Welcome back, Carrie and Carl. So we can. We can we can we can drop drop the slide here. Uh, yeah, we're at we're at we're coming up at around 300 questions. We got close to 7,000 people, so a great audience. And and I'll just say, you know, just the, kind of concluding that last discussion during this business relief phase, we spoke with a lot of government officials, and you know this, Carl. And the quality of 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 the applications for businesses that worked with firms, licensed firms versus, mm. you know, just bookkeepers was dramatically different. And, and, and these are the reasons why. So I, we're going to take this, this good feedback coming in here today about the quality management standards. We're going to get, we'll get that off to Jennifer, you and the team and uh, look forward to continuing this discussion as, as, as this, as this evolves. So Mark, I mean, more, more questions on, uh, you know, retroactivity, I mean, obviously, you know, people were worried uh, in September about, you know, the September 13th capital gains date. I'll have to say there's more retroactivity concerns now because there's a lot of people here about with the ERC saying, wow, you know, the infrastructure bill had that in there. It had it, had it not going into Q4. Now, if you sign in for this bill in, uh, you know, the final week of the year. So, Maybe just because there's been a couple more questions on that, maybe a, a few more reflections from you. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, again, you know, we don't, a lot of these things that happen at the end of the process are to squeeze everything into a 10 year budget process. And so, retroactivity, sunsetting of provisions, um, it's very, very hard to predict right now because it's not about, in the end, again, they're, they're more concerned with getting the bill out than some of the specific narrow impacts, you know, on practitioners. So, you know, I don't have a lot of clarity for the, anybody on that yet. It's something that we talk about a lot and, you know, we, we, we make sure that the policymakers understand the impact of that. Um, but it's, it's very much in play. As a matter of fact, even since my prediction earlier, it looks like they're having some challenges getting the votes for, for the um, uh, debt limit right now. Well, that, that, as you said, Mark, you know, the, the bill's not going to pass till it does, or right. the bill is going to pass until it doesn't. <laughs> so, hey, Carrie, how do you look? So there's so much work to be done. So like when you, when you think about it, as you're talking to the firms out there and, and Carl, you could jump in here too on something like this, you know, you probably, you, you know, do, do an ERC application for, you know, the Q1, Q2 and Q3, but also you should wait um till you have have more guidance before you know you can tell your client that this could be a possibility but how 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 are you advising firms with with this uncertainty well my first words to them are i understand this is stressful right clients obviously want to get get their information and cpas want to get this off their plates and move on to the next thing i think we've had a number a number of comments today in the q a that have said things like this was the tax season that never ended in 2020, 2021, and we just keep dragging on. The best I can tell everyone with all these uncertainties is just try to make a plan. If you have PPP and you know your client can get forgiveness for a certain threshold of PPP funds, um, make a map and navigate that out. And then you have at least that taken off the plate so you can work with whatever's left over for ERC. Um, Carl, I'll let you jump in as well with your thoughts. Yeah, no, I, that, that's a great suggestion, Carrie. Um, the, the biggest, you know, so I get a lot of emails and, and from different networking groups and different organizations around, you know, firms around the country that are all, they're all asking themselves, have you gotten any kind of, you know, ERC refund yet? Or, you know, what's happening with your 941 X's, you know, are you getting any, or then there's a problem. So the, the, the thing that 
you know, we keep coming back and we've talked about this for months, even on the town halls is patience. You know, there's, there's nothing we can do to, to make the IRS give us clarity on any particular issue. Uh, we can't make those things happen, even though now people just laugh at me and say, well, what are you guys doing about it? But it's patience. And, and if we can keep preaching patience, but the concern that firms have, of course, now is that they're coming up to the next tax season and the planning season right now and then taxis. And so their patience is running a little bit thin, but it is still a matter of just being patient and, and working with what you can. And, and the, it's not like the IRS isn't aware of it. I mean, we're all over them and have been. Right, right, absolutely. Well, I mean, it, it, I, it, this is this is great engagement, great, great engagement uh, from the audience. Uh, let me just, uh, just uh, Jennifer, a question, not, not about the quality management standard, but about the risk assessment standard, you know, you know, where is that right now with the ASB? Is there any 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 future plans in the works uh, to to that standard? Yes. So the ASB approved a new risk assessment standard at its August meeting. Uh, we will be. It has gone through editorial since then. It'll be launched and issued on October twelfth. So be on the lookout at look out for it next week. In addition, we are in the process of updating the risk assessment guide. Chuck Landis, our former chief auditor, is helping us update the risk assessment guide, and it's really uh, meant to be geared toward uh, smaller uh, auditing smaller entities and performing a risk assessment in relation to audits of smaller entities. We know that is an area of concern also by your members, how to perform a risk assessment when you're doing an audit of a less complex entity. So that's what this uh, risk assessment guide will be focused on. Well, th thanks. Uh, Carl, you know, th here was, they said, this is great. You, you brought Lisa Bedell here. You talked about simplification and keeping things simple. And then, and then we, we went into one that we're trying to simplify things with PP and ERC. And then, and then we, we talked about the, the quality management standard. And I, and I, we, I, we know that there, there's stress out there, but Carl, just comment on that. Like Carl's corner, how, if you, because you were out there, you're out there with the firms all the time. So um, comment on that. They call it a juxtaposition here. One thing, keep things simpler. And another thing that, you know, we're, we're rolling out a quality management standard. <laughs> Well, th there's no doubt the stress is out there, anxiety is out there, the pressure is out there. Um, you know, we haven't talked about the pipeline and staffing and the concern about that. And we haven't talked about wellness, but there's a lot of initiatives, a lot of things happening as it relates to health and wellness that we're even doing within our organization and trying to work with firms. Um, keeps coming back to um, change management too as well, right? It's not just patients, but it's change management. Cl and managing client expectations is in particular. And, you know, all the things that are happening, all the things that are up in the air, all the notices that uh, your, your clients are receiving, uh, it's manage those expectations, especially as you go into this new tax season, busy season, manage those, those expectations is going to be critical to your own, you know, mental health and well-being and your staff. Well, and, and I'll just, in, just in, in closing here, say that these are the strengths. These are the strengths of, of the firm, of the services that have been provided, the standards, uh, the quality measures. And, and I think that that is really the differentiator. We, we saw that over the past year. And then we're, we're talking about strategies and capabilities. So what we're trying to do here at the town hall is explain the standards, explain the latest tax positions, and then use technology at times to kind of advance some of your capabilities. If it's in client accounting services or or, or other services you're providing. We're thinking about that with the audit service. So technology is going to play a role. And we probably haven't had a technology discussion. Uh, we haven't had tech in, la in the last couple of town halls. I think we'll bring one of those back because it's, it's the combination. So um, a lot of information today. Uh, it was definitely a, a, a power hour, a lot of great updates. Uh, so let's now kind of close with uh, the resource sections uh, that we leave you with every week. Um, so that was the, those are the presenters. You can definitely stay in touch with us on social media. Here's the past town halls. And one question came in about, you know, uh, PowerPoint slides. We're going to try to make some of those available to you in a, in a, in a seamless fashion as well. Uh, but watch the archives. Uh, Lisa talked about, I mean, Carrie talked about the, the resource center, leverage that. Um, there's more ERC resources here. These are all clickable links if you if you download the slides and you can do that in the resource section of, of this webinar uh, 
uh, interface. Digital CPA, that's an in-person event, but you can also attend it virtually. Um, it's, a, it's a great gathering of progressive firms of all sizes, and that's going to be at the end of this year in Tennessee, but you, you can also attend virtually. Welcome uh, having many of you uh, join us for that session. So once again, we hold these town halls twice a month. Uh, our next one is October 21st, and then the one following that is November, November 4th. I do want to thank again the team uh, that puts together these materials. We think uh, about how to make each town hall as, as informative as possible, um, bring you the latest information, and also try to unpack it and give you strategies on how to best uh, move your practice or if you're in business and industry, uh, your company forward. So thanks for your time today. Uh, do stay in touch with us via social media. Um, we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Uh, hope you have a good, you know, October 15th, you know, get, get through that milestone. Um, and uh, we look forward to being with you again soon. Thanks again for today. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.